Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ishai, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Lifecycle. Today I'm going to talk about um, how to create an amazing onboarding experience uh, for developers when they engage with a new code base, a new and unfamiliar code base, uh, using self-contained development environment. Um, I'll start with a short story. A um, few years ago, I led the development of an internal product that was later released as an open source solution for feature flagging and remote configuration. Now, during that time, uh, we wanted developers at the company uh, to contribute code to the project. It was an open source project after all. And um, we, to achieve that, we've organized a company-wide hackathon. Because the project was called Tweak, we naturally called it a Tweakathon. And we were excited. We created documentation, additional documentation for the project. Uh, we created a dedicated backlog for the event. We promote the event, uh, print t-shirts. But at the end, well, it didn't work that well. We got very few contributions. And the main reason was that developers were, were struggling to run the application, let alone write code or, or test it or develop new, new features. And it was because a Tweak was a complex uh, application, it still is a complex application, and it can take lots of hours and frustration of developers and uh, lots of tricks to make uh, such a complex project work on a, on a development machine. And today I'm going to talk about how we can create a better experience. Before we dive into that, let me tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Ishai, I'm a CTO and co-founder of Lifecycle. I'm a full stack developer for at least a decade. I'm passionate about cloud development, backend architecture, user experience, developer experience, functional programming, and of course, Docker. I'm uh, the creator and maintainer of Twig, an open source cloud native feature management solution. That's what I talked before. And I care deeply on simple simplicity, consistency, and elegance in, uh, in code. So that, that was me. Uh, let, you, let me tell you about Lifecycle. Uh, we are uh, an early startup that's building the next generation collaboration tools for development uh, teams. Um, it's based on building continuously playground environment that are rich and interactable and any stakeholders in the organization can engage with them. And we are trying to bridge the gap between coders and non-coders. The project is currently stealth, but uh, will be soon be in public beta. Uh, so be sure to check it out. So let's get back to the problem. How does it feel to start working on a new complex code base? Okay, so first of all, we are trying to build and run. And we might encounter the problem that we have the wrong OS. Or we have missing dependencies that we need to install, like a SDK, a language SDK, uh, runtimes. In many cases, we have a conflicting SDK, like in Node, we can have like Node 12 and the, it require Node 16, or the same can go with Ruby or Python or, the, or the .NET. And beside that, we have like the package managers that going, are going to probably throw some random errors that we are going to search them on Stack Overflow or ask someone that uh, managed to get it uh, proper, uh, properly. Afterwards, we'll read the README and try to make it work. We'll run some uh, magic scripts and watch them fail in some cases. We we'll, might, might need to change our host file, install other tools and dependencies or databases or whatever uh, the README required us. And maybe if, uh, if you, you know, in an organization that have lots of uh, security, you might need to install a root CA or something like that. Uh, and additionally, afterward, we are, we are trying to develop, but the debugging not necessarily work, breakpoints are not triggered, uh, the ID might not have correct autocomplete or dependencies, the code watch we rebuild mechanism doesn't work and we have exhausted our watch files and we need something like Watchman. Art model reloading doesn't work because whatever WebSocket issue or course issue. And maybe we have additional problem, problems with external dependencies that we need to use um, and connect and configure. 
And then we get to integration test and well, that's an all different nightmare with Selenium and other tools that require much more complex and they are flaky and not working properly. But the worst part about it, beside all of this, is that usually after a few months of working on a different project, we'll probably need to do it all over and over again. Um, because the environment change, our computer change, and then we'll be like, ah, again. So why is it so difficult? I mean, all developers love to build tools. I mean, shouldn't we solve this problem? I mean, probably every developer know it to some uh, extension, depending on the complexity of the project they are working. Uh, so it's difficult, to, par part of it is because we have so many uh, tools. We have so many versions of fermentation of different SDK and runtimes, different operation systems. Uh, we have this work on my machine syndrome that if it work on my machine, I'm not going to touch it. And well, I'm going to use this old machine that work and install a new a developer machine after mine will burn or something. Uh, we have vast amount of tool chains and ID and they are rapidly uh, changing and we have new and new and new ver versions. Our development flows are much more complex and can easily break. It's not just building and running, we have debugging, we have watch, we have auto reloading, we, in some cases we have Docker months. Our developer machines are polluted and overloaded with tools. Um, and yeah, it's a waste of time and lots and lots of uh, frustration. To solve it, I mean, what, what's the dream of development environment? Well, the way I see it, we want developer environment that are consistent. They provide the same predictable experience. No random stuff that is happening out of nowhere. They are reproducible, so I can kill them, destroy them, and then rebuild or reprovision them. Um, so that, that's important. Additionally, they are isolated. They are not affected by other stuff that is running on my computer, whether it's other developer environment or my machine itself. They are self-contained, meaning that all the dependencies and tools needed for development are defined and packaged inside the, that environment and they are unbreakable. We won't struggle with countless hours to get things working again. In the, I mean, in the worst case, we can just rebuild it. Now, some of the things are said about uh, containers and about Docker, that's one of the premises that uh, it provides with uh, Docker images. And two years ago, VS Code, one of the most popular uh, uh, ID, had support for uh, developing on a, on a container. The, it was part of the uh, remote extension. And the interest, interesting part is, I mean, in the past, there are some companies that use a VM and they provision them and they, um, developers use them instead of their own machine. But there are some problems with that because besides the, that it requires a lot of uh, operations. Um, in addition, we somehow don't have the best uh, experience because the, the, the ID itself is not running locally. But in VS, case, VS Code case, um, the front end of the ID is running locally on our machine and the back end, which, uh, which in, um, contain the, the application file, a terminal session, the language server and extension that are running, are run in a server that is packed inside a container. So we get a, a local experience, but um, we operate on a remote file system and on a remote machine. So that, that's uh, pretty awesome. And I'm going to show how we are going to use uh, this technology. Before uh, we begin, uh, I'm going to show lots of examples on different uh, code repository and how to, to run them. All the examples and slides are available on GitHub, so you can check it out afterwards. All the tools in this presentation are based on open source and free to use project, so you can use them yourself easily. And most examples here are far from bulletproof, they can op be optimized. And some of them use tools that can be considered experimental. That's a bit of a disclaimer here. So let's, let's begin. And I'm going to start with a project. Uh, it's uh, a simple one. It's a CLI tool for creating ASCII art from images. It's called uh, Image to ASCII. 
the project is written in Go, but it's an older version of Go before we have a Go model. And I'm going to uh, run it with a development container. So let's uh, open it. I have it here. And that's the, the open source repository open, or actually a fork of it. For all repositories, I'm using a fork. And um, you can see that the ID here, it looks like a regular VS code, but it's actually run inside a development container. We see it here in the status page in the green one. What does it mean? Well, I'll show a quick example. If I'll open here a command prompt, and yes, I'm running Windows, which is embarrassing, but um, I'm going to try to run Go, and I don't have it here. Um, I don't have it here because it's my personal machine, um, and it's not a develop, the host operation system does not uh, have any uh, developer tools beside Docker and Git. So I have Docker, and I can see that here I have the, oh, the different uh, development container running. We'll get to it uh, afterwards. But what's interesting, we don't have Go here, but we do have it here. And the reason for that is that this terminal is not running on my actual computer, it's running inside the development container. Um, so how does this uh, happen? In? How does, does this happen? We have a dev container that defined we, that we are going to use it, uh, def, that it contains instructions for uh, VS Code, how to open this environment. So we have some settings related to Golang. We have extension that uh, it means that the extension of Golang is going to be installed inside the IDE. So we see it here. Uh, and we have a Docker file that contains the image uh, our instruction for how to build the image for that development container. So we can see that it's a base Ubuntu image with Go install, Go 1.16, with uh, Go modules off because it's an old product. Uh, so we need uh, to use, um, um, you know, we, we need to use uh, Go without Go modules. Um, and we also install a, a DEP which is, a, which is a, a, it's an early uh, Golang dependency manager that the, this project is using, and uh, some extension for the, the shell uh, for, that we have autocomplete for Golang and Git. Okay, so that, that's basically it. Um, and another thing, we can see that the PWE, the directory here, is actually GoSRC GitHub.com, um, inside like a, a Go path of a model. Now, the reason for that is because it's an old project, we have to clone it in a specific directory. So to achieve it, that we have a workspace that defines this folder. And in the dev container, we have also, um, we create a theme link for that directory. And that's pretty awesome because on my machine, it will be really terrible uh, to, to put it in that way. And uh, I mean, I always have problem with Go that it uh, Go in the past that it has. Uh, uh, I mean, enforced me to install the project to clone to a specific directory. That was a terrible experience, at least uh, in my opinion. Um, okay, so we run in the right folder with the right tools. We have also DEP, which is for the dependency. Uh, the, for checking the Go dependency here, we have the Go package here. And I'm going to try to run the project. And I'm going to put a URL that I'm going to turn into ASCII. Now it doesn't work because the, this CLI only works with uh, files. It doesn't work with uh, URLs. So I want to add this feature. So I'll get, go here to the convert. And you can see that I have autocomplete and everything work properly. Basically the, the code that I want uh, to change here is the function that, is da that uh, downloads the image. Um, and it's the open image file. Now I'm not going to do it right now, but believe me, it's only a few uh, lines of code. I'm just going to check out to a branch that I've already implemented it in. Okay, so we can see the open image file as HTTP check, and if so, it's down the image. Very few lines of code. And then I'm going to try uh, uh, to run it. And we see we have uh, an image 
I can also run image of myself here. So everything works properly and we've added some code and we have a good experience here. Everything works out, out of the box. Despite this is a version, an older version of Go and Go models and we need to insert it in the same directory. Actually, in most cases, um, opening the repository and making to work uh, properly with the tool can take more, more time than implemented, implementing this uh, small fix. Okay, so let's get back to uh, the presentation. What we've seen here, uh, we saw a development container that is integrated with the SCM. I could do a checkout to a branch. I did remote code editing. I have a remote terminal. And um, we configured the environment to set up the runtime SDKs, the shell extension we want, some tricks with environment variable and path, like the Go modules and the uh, Simlink. And we defined the extension we need, in this case, a single extension, which is uh, the Golang. So that was simple. Let's try uh, something that is a bit more complex, a web server. So that's a simple Flask app to send email-based uh, uh, email and based on SendGit example. We have here some new challenges, uh, such as running and interacting with a server and uh, managing the applications in Python also, and also managing secrets because we need to have like SendGit API key and I also show how we can debug it. So let's get, get to the next example, the simple email sender example. So we, are, we have here a dev container with uh, Python. We can see uh, that we have the extension of Python. We have a Docker file, and the Docker file, in addition to installing uh, Python, um, or Python is already installed because it's a base image, we are going to install an additional tool called SOPS. SOPS is a tool for uh, encrypting, um, um, for encrypting secret, and then we can put them inside the repository. How does it work? Well, I have here the secret encrypted JSON that contains SendGrid API key and mail default sender. And you see that the data is encrypted. We can't use it, but I can decrypt it uh, using SOPS minus D and write it to a .n file. I actually have the script running in the init. So let's do it. And what is happening, uh, the SOPS YAML definition defined the PGP key that uh, we are supporting. It actually can be not just PGP, it can also connect to a cloud encryption and service uh, solution like uh, Azure, KMA, Azure uh, Key Vault or AWS KMS. Uh, and now that created the data with the right va uh, values. Uh, to showcase an example how it looks like, I'm going to um, take another file that we have here, example, uh, and I'm going to decrypt it. Uh, we have here some secret number, so I'm going to decrypt. Instead of the secret, I'm going to decrypt example. Oh. Okay. And we see that we got the the data with some, with some secret number with 42. It didn't work before because it, this format is not compatible with uh, dot env that I was asking. So very simple, that's the value, the meaning of the universe. Um, and okay, so let's try to run our Python app. And you see that I've already have a configuration here. That's because that in the launch day, so I define how to run the application here and how to uh, debug it. And I'm going to run Python debug. And the application is running. Now, because the application is running on a port inside the container, we need to do a port forwarding to be able to access it on my local machine. So we see that it already did it automatically. But we, if we look here, we have a port. And we see that uh, port uh, 5000 is bound to port 5000 on my local machine. So if I'll go here. I'll have the application running and I'm going to uh, send an email to test abc123 at mailinator. Mailinator, let's check. Yes, I'm test abcd. Oh, it's abcd. abcd123 at mailinator. Maybe I should copy it. No, it works. 
Great, so we have the, the email and it was sent. And beside we see that the application working and I'm interacting it with it on my local machine. Um, I can also put breakpoints. Um, so let's go to the app pie and put here some breakpoint and send again. And it's stuck probably because of the breakpoint. And we see the breakpoint here. So we have a good debugging experience and it works out of the box. And that, that's awesome. So let's kill it. Oh, yeah. And let's talk a bit about it. Uh, so I'll go back to the slides. So we saw, we are, we saw the usage of secret encryption. Uh, so the secret still uh, the secrets, uh, sit inside the repository, but encrypted. Uh, we are using Mozilla SOPs for encrypting, the, encrypting and decrypting the secrets. Uh, in this example, I'm using a GPG key. I haven't shown it, but if I go here to GPG list keys. So, oops, that's it. GPG list keys. No, that's the ASCII, oh sorry. That's the project, gpg.liskeys. So you see that I have the, the GPG key installed on that uh, machine, so I can use it for decrypting the data. So GPG keys are nice for start, but uh, there, there, there are so many problems with GPG, so in, my, in most cases it will be better to integrate, with, to integrate with a cloud encryption as a service solution, such as KMS and Key Vault. Uh, the metadata is saved and encrypted, um, which makes it easy to do diffing and check history. And this practice, uh, this is a practice that is popular in uh, when using GitOps. So in GitOps, we want to have uh, the uh, our our deployment configuration configured inside Git as a single source of truth. But in many cases, we need to encrypt secret. So one of the solution is to encrypt uh, the the secret and put them in the repository and they are going to be decrypted by uh, the CD solution via push or pull. And are, because it's a popular practice, there are other solutions as well to achieve that. Additionally, we saw some other IDE settings like the launch setting that we are used to define the configuration of the Python app and we put it inside the dev container and also port forwarding. Uh, we can fall port on the, uh, on the local host and the port forwarding definition itself is also part of the dev container uh, uh, JSON file. Now the next project is more complex. It's a real project, not like that sample app. And it's an uh, open source web-based RPG for organizing your life. It's called Abitica. Ab Abitica. I remember that I played with it like a few years ago and it got a lot more bigger and uh, more complex. And it's, it, it uh, have new, challenge, new challenges. Uh, it's a huge project. We have front-end, back-end, and DBL, and we are going to run it. So the first uh, thing we are going to go to do, because this is a, is a full stack app, uh, instead of running in the dev container a Docker file, we are going to run a Docker Compose which will contain the dependency we have. So we have the dev container of the app here, but additionally, we have the DB, uh, Mongo Express for easily viewing the, the DB document, uh, documents, and the traffic, which is a reverse proxy, I'll talk about it uh, later, why we, need, uh, why we need one. Okay, so that's basically our, uh, uh, our services that we have. In the launch the JSON, we have a configuration for the client, the server, storybook, which is for the UI component, and also files for the documentation site. So I'm going to run every one of them. Let's run the docs, the server. I see that the client and the storybook are still running, so no need to run them. Um, and let's check it out. So the reason I wanted to use a reverse proxy is because I can, um, we are running here lots of services, like four uh, services, and I want to use only a single port to serve them. So a reverse proxy can use, we can use a reverse proxy for that. And based on, on, a, on, a, on the host, we are going to serve the right, uh, the right uh, website. 
So let's see how it looks like. How it looks like. <laughs> what does it look like? Um, so I'll run them in parallel. Okay, the first thing to load is uh, Mongo Express. Um, here we can see the database and we have a user's database and we can see that I already have a test user here. We'll talk a bit about how we, we have the, this user. Um, we have the commentation site here that's also part of the repository and storybook for uh, looking at the component. And here we have the application itself. I see that I'm already signed in, so I'm going to do a logout and re-login. So how do I have a user in this application? It's pretty simple. When the application is created, I've created a script here that is going, uh, it's like a post create command for the dev container that is going to insert the data directly to Mongo. So the data is uh, contain a, a test user, some task, and some groups da data. And basically every time someone is going to create a de development container, they are going to do initial data there. It's called a uh, data seeding. So if I go here and try to log in, you'll notice that I have a test user. And uh, the application is running, as you've, seen, uh, as you've seen before, I have um, all, um, the, the user is already initialized with some uh, data. So we'll see a list of tasks here. The page takes some time to load. Um, I think it's like uh, several tens of uh, megabyte, the, the, this page. So it can take uh, some time, but here we see the task and I can change them uh, and some tasks. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and notice that we have four different applications that are exposed on the same ports. How does it work? Well, we use a wildcard uh, local DNS, like localtest.me. Uh, it means that everything, um, if I'll put like a command line here, so you'll see that if I'm going to use uh, NS lookup, So it's going to put to one, uh, 127.0.0.1 um, and basically every uh, subdomain of localdesk.me is going to uh, go to, to, um, to my localhost. Now on the localhost I have a single port but I'm based on the subdomain I'm routing it to the right place. How does this magic happen? Uh, so we are using a tool called uh, traffic which is a reverse proxy that have very smart uh, service discovery system. So based on uh, some annotations we add to the Docker Compose, we can define what the host that we want to run and what port we want to expose to traffic. So basically that, uh, that's what's happening here and traffic itself is running on port uh, 8000. So I'll just uh, stop the app. Okay, let's go next. Now the next project, uh, so that we saw a full stack application with Docker Compose a database. Um, another thing that I haven't shown, um, we have here, um, here we have a Mongo extension. So we can also see uh, the document here directly from the ID and it's come built in with defined in the dev container as well, what's the extension we want to use. Okay, sorry for the flicking uh, images. So we have uh, installed some additional tools. Uh, we use a DB image of Mongo and uh, Docker Compose. We did data seeding with basic script. Alternatively, it can be done by replicating or cloning data from staging or production. Um, we use a reverse proxy to route dependencies to several subdomains instead of port. Uh, we use loc wildcard local host DNSs, uh, so localtest.me or XAP is a, a similar one. 
And we use traffic, a very simpler, uh, simple and developer friendly reverse proxy. Now the next project is personal, and naturally it's a tweak, the project I talked about before. Um, and it's very complex project. Uh, we already use Docker Compose inside um, for developing. Um, because this project contains several microservices, several uh, databases, messaging system, cross-service communication, it polyglot, so we need to install lots of different SDK uh, to provide good experience. The architecture looks something like that. So yeah, it's, it's a, a real complex uh, system. And yet we are going to run it and even quite easily. So let's look at a um, tweak dev container. And because tweak, container, uh, tweak already use um, uh, Docker, so we are going to install in our dev container uh, a Docker in Docker uh, installation. What, is, what does it mean? It means that here, if I do Docker PS, I have a Docker daemon that is dedicated to this dev environment. So it's like running Docker inside of Docker. So I'm installing Docker inside of Docker. I'm installing uh, some uh, extensions. I'm installing .NET, Golang, Node.js, and Yarn, and I'm installing Tilt, which is a tool for um, rebuilding, uh, watching and rebuilding uh, services and pu uh, pu pushing them to, uh, to, uh, to the Docker daemon. I'll show them in a minute how it looks like. I'll, I can run it. A bit like Docker Compose app, but with auto loading. So we have a dev container, we have all the relevant extension, one for Golang, for .NET, for a, a Docker itself. We have the, the extension here, a pretty here. Um, we have a script that installed all the NPM packages and everything that we need. Um, and uh, the idea here that uh, Tweak has a, a, a YAML for uh, development, uh, it already had it with um, initially, that defined all the services, and um, some services are mock. For example, we have an OpenID server mock uh, to fake uh, an OpenID provider, um, OpenID Connect provider, like uh, Google, for example. And additionally, we use Redis here, and we use Minio, which is a, um, a solution um, uh, and uh, a data, uh, an object storage solution that is well compatible with uh, S3. So we use it, we can use it uh, instead of S3. That is one of the dependency of Tweak as well. Okay, so we have the tilt, tilt running. Tilt define how to build uh, all the images. It loads the Docker Compose YAML, and it also support auto reloading. Uh, and as we are going to see in a second for uh, features like the UI. So it's copied the file for my computer to the uh, develop for, to the internal container. Now notice that if I'm going to do a Docker PS here, I'm going to see all Tweak services that are running. Now if I'm going to open Tilt, so in Tilt we can see all the resources that are running, that they were built. Um, we can see the log for each service. For example, we can look at here at the editor. And here we have the editor uh, running. And I'm going to show example of editing uh, code in the editor. Oh, I have it here open. Um, so I'm going to change the welcome message. Hello, everyone. Just, uh, let's see that it's... Uh, Sorry, spoiler. So that's what it looks like. Welcome tweak. And I'm going to change it to hello everyone. Change the font to 60. Change the color a bit and save. Now we see that it changed instantly and we have a great developer experience with just opening the dev container and running tilt up. And that's for all the services. And I, I can't, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I wish I have this kind of solution a um, few years ago. We had so much a better hackathon with, with it. It's really, it's really amazing that you can 
uh, go to a complex project like Twig and start developing and uh, everything just work. Not just for the editor, but the, for the older component as well. Okay. So I'll go back, 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 desktops away to the to tweak. In this example, we see a Docker and Docker example. There are several um, techniques for running uh, nested containers. Uh, in this example, we use actual Docker and Docker. Um, we are developing in nested containers and using Tilt and, and Docker Compose for uh, rebuilding and watching and not reloading. And naturally, because we're running inside uh, containers and our code is run inside development containers that require rebuilding, things will get a bit slower, but it's totally worth it. Additionally, we saw an example of mocking uh, cloud dependencies. So in Twig, we use a, a Docker image of a database, uh, Redis. Uh, at production, we use a cloud solution uh, equivalent. Uh, we use a wild comp compatible solution to S3. Uh, uh, to have free its menu for OpenID Connect, its OIDC mock server. Um, we can mock cloud dependency additionally with uh, full frameworks like a local stack or um, encrypt credentials and connect to dedicated tenants or do dynamic provisioning. That's also an option if you want uh, to have real cloud dependencies. Um, and I'm going to finish with the last example, um, which is a cube cost. Um, it's a tool for managing Kubernetes cost. The reason I'm going to show this example is because it uses Kubernetes, so it's pretty cool. And we need Kubernetes, metric server, and Prometheus. Um, so I'm going to turn uh, off Twig because it's quite heavy. And we'll move to the, the last example. So here I'm in the cube cost dev container. And you'll notice that I have uh, Kubernetes running here. I have a cube cattle um, and I have also a Prometheus here. I think that it's in namespace monitoring. Yeah. And it's basically, um, we have, like before, we have a Docker file, but instead of just installing uh, Docker and Docker and Docker, we install cube cattle and Elm. And another cool tool that is called uh, K3D. Now, K3D is a tool for um, uh, creating uh, clusters of K3S, which is a very lightweight uh, Kubernetes um, distribution. So we can do like K3D cluster uh, list and see the cluster. And it's actually running inside Docker. So if I'll do a Docker PS, I'll see the, the K3S um, uh, images here uh, running. See K3S v1.21. So that's uh, pretty amazing. We have a Kubernetes that runs inside Docker. And we also have a registry for putting the image. So Tilt can integrate it in the build, uh, in the bi watch build uh, loop. Uh, which is amazing. And we also have a, a Prometheus uh, YAML that uh, define how to run the Elm chart. So one thing, cool thing about a, a K3S is that is, uh, it has built-in support for uh, Elm chart. Uh, it has a custom um, controller and a custom resource that's called uh, Elm chart. And we can declare uh, these Elm charts uh, declaratively. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and I'm going to run it the same way we have a tilt up. Instead of connecting to the Docker Compose, tilt interact directly with Kubernetes. So the same rules apply. If I'm going to change code, it's going to be rebuild uh, the image. Uh, we are going to serve it as well. And um, just uh, that you notice, we have the contributing guide here. And to build a project, besides we need to install like uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus, we need to build the image, um, create namespace, apply it, uh, and do like a port forwarding. And every time there's like this manual steps I need to build uh, the image and um, uh, when I'm developing. But here I'm doing something else completely. I'm going to do it, but everything is, go is happening automatically uh, thanks to, to, to Tilt. So that's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so here we have, uh, need to refresh it here. 
So here we have still running with cost model and the UI. Uh, we can see that it work here, the API, it cost uh, data uh, model, and we can see that we have data. And we also have the UI here, and I'm going to show that it's working and integrated, it works against the relevant uh, backend here. Now, the nice thing about it is that uh, in this case, while the cost model is a Kubernetes resource, the UI is a local one. So it's kind of um, it's kind of lighter in that regard. We can see that in tilt file we have a local resource and a Kubernetes resource. So that's about it. Uh, we can see that we have all the right pods here, and it's real real data. Awesome. So that was the last example. Uh, thank you for listening so far. I'll go back. Okay. Okay. So the last example uh, was uh, was a cube cost uh, cube cost, and basically, it Kubernetes local development is already difficult. There's lots of fragmentation. We have mini cube, Docker for desktop, micro Kubernetes kind, and using a single Kubernetes distro and version can make life easy. In this case, we use K3S. It's a minimal Kubernetes distribution. Images are pushed to the to dedicated registry that is built in with the KHLOS installation, or um, in this case, it's actually uh, by K3D. It's, it's, um, the, the configuration is in K3S, but K3D is, uh, is running the, the dedicated registry. Um, it's stable, cluster can be uh, recreated easily. Uh, just to um, showcase that, I'm going to um, here. I'm going to tear down the cluster. Okay, and I'm going to recreate it. And you can see how fast it is. And if you work with other Kubernetes tools before, you know that usually creating a Kubernetes cluster take, uh, takes uh, can take some time. This happening in less than uh, 20 seconds, and it's running inside a container. So it's pretty amazing. See, I have working Kubernetes. So that's about it. Um, now it talks about comes built in with an NM controller that uh, help us installing NM chart declaratively, and we still use Tilt for building, pushing, and running. And to put this setup uh, simply, we have a Docker host that uh, inside is a dev container that we have Docker in Docker uh, that we have um, that run registry in K3S node that run container D that run our app. Or to put it visually. So that's it for the demos. Um, okay, so we saw containers development environment. Um, the good thing about it that the development, development environment configuration is also source controlled and correspond to the application code. The developer machine stays clean. It can scale well to multiple environments without conflict. It can run locally or remotely easily because it's based on Docker. Um, our own setup its lifecycle contains of tens of uh, microservices in Golang and TypeScript. Um, Auth model reloading with front end, our own Kubernetes custom resource and controllers, external dependencies that we have, GraphQL engine, database, full blown CI system, container registry, and lots and lots of stuff, and CLIs and SDKs. And the time it takes to be rebuild our environment uh, from scratch is about 15 minutes. The time to build run test code changes are 10 seconds around it. Uh, time to onboard new developer, it's three hours, less than that, and that includes remote provision of a dedicated host on AWS and giving all the right access and credentials. Uh, time to introduce new, new tool and update this development environment if needed, it's less than five minutes, and we're constantly adding a new CLI or tool. There's no more work on my machine occurrences, there's no stand on the developer machines because they are running remotely. Uh, developers need to deal with 
less, the less secrets because they are encrypted in the repository, uh, so no passing them around. And our team work on both M1 and Intel Max. So it's pretty amazing. I hope to optimize it further to have shared build cache. So if several uh, developers build the application, so everyone will get a better uh, build performance. Snapshot for reducing the initial load. Um, and in the future, use a cloud provider optimized for dev machine. In terms of cost, location, uh, hibernation, CPU, RAM, etc. There are some drawbacks over. Uh, the, creation, the creating the initial setup can take some time. It took me several hours to add, add this dev container as a file for um, almost every one of the repositories I, I showed here. Uh, there are so many tools here. Some of them are bleeding edge, so they can break. And uh, we have additional code to manage, which is the dev container JSON, the Docker file, the initialization, data seeding. Uh, dev environment are not standardized yet, so if you use a different solution than VS Code and Docker, um, there are a different standard on how to do it. So that, that we, we are coupled in our solution to VS Code, Docker, Git, and Linux. Um, there are several performance issues, and there are some security challenges when working between development and production, although it, it's uh, solvable. Now, can we do it without VS Code? So it's probably possible to use a terminal-based uh, code editor. I haven't used it for that example, but it should work. Uh, also, there's gitpod.io and fia that have similar features with a different configuration file called gitpod.yaml. JetBrains has a solution for uh, remote development that you can run a projector inside the, the application or the, the VM or the container. And it's supposed to work a bit like, uh, it's supposed to stream the, the, the environment. I'm not sure how well it works because I haven't tried, but there are so many developers that love the JetBrains stack, so it's definitely worth uh, keep watching. And we can run local ID with documents, but to be fair, it doesn't work that well. Uh, I haven't shown example of serverless, but it should probably work in many cases, at least the cases we can run it locally. So basically we should use a fast framework, uh, an SDK that can run locally, and for the past features, we can use tools like Minio or LocalStack or, um, or emulators or something like that. And if necessary, we can throw infrastructure as code tool to the mix like Pulumi or Terraform and do like a dynamic provision in for every development environment we create. Uh, all the examples I've shown are mon monorepo. I'm not sure what's the best way to approach it with a in a multi-repo, maybe a single dev container with multiple sub-modules, maybe treating other repositories as dependencies. There are some uh, interesting projects that take approach that we have a Git URL and we can translate it easily to a Docker image. Um, native mobile, I, I, if I'm opti very optimistic about uh, multi-repo or um, other editors, native mobile is disaster. The problem exists, and I remember engaging in epic battles with mobile IDE and with Gradle. Um, it might be possible to stream the applications uh, that they run an emulator and then we stream it, but the experience is not optimal. Containers are also optimized for Linux. For running mobile emulator, we need virtualiz nested virtualization. Uh, the IDE are themselves are mobile, are tailored for mobile development, so. It's very difficult to develop uh, uh, an Android or iOS project without the, the, their own development tools. Uh, it might be easier or possible with uh, cross-platform frameworks such as React Native or Flutter. And um, now it's part of a larger uh, trend that we see that is happening that uh, we put more stuff in the repository like linting, style guide, documentation, open API, CI pipeline definition, workflow, design system, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at the end, we have a self-contained repositories. Uh, all code, tools, knowledge definition, and process related to project reside in the repository. Git act as a single source of truth. The code is more accessible. We are lowering the bar barrier of entry. The applications are portable. And uh, as developers, as code, code uh, owners, we can create a fine-grained developer experience, which is awesome. Um, all of this is happening as part of an emerging ecosystem. 
Uh, we can see it with remote ID, remote development environment, cloud IDEs, PR environment, uh, which is one of the things we are offering at Lifecycle, uh, specifically PR environment. And I've shown many tools here and different uh, challenges and solutions and what to use. Um, all the resources and examples will be uploaded to um, to the uh, to the talk uh, page and to my uh, report to the talk repository and to my Twitter account. So be sure to, uh, so you can check it out. And thank you very much. Thank you.